Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us. My name is Kelsey Franklin with Aberdeen Group, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar, The Right Tools for the Job, Encryption for Data at Rest and Backend Systems. The webinar today is hosted by Aberdeen Group and sponsored by Vormetric. Our presenters are Derek Brink, CISSP Vice President and Research Fellow at Aberdeen Group, and Charles Goldberg, Senior Director of Product Marketing at Vormetric. If you'd like to read their full bios, please use the drop-down arrow below their photos on the left of your screen. We have about 45 minutes of content prepared today, followed by a 15-minute Q&A session. I encourage you all to submit your questions throughout the webinar using the Q&A field on the top left of your screen, and our speakers will try to address as many of your questions as possible at the end. To the right of your screen is our resource list. There you'll find today's presentation deck, as well as some additional data sheets and content about today's webinar. You'll also see our Twitter widget on the right, where you can live tweet the event with the hashtag EncryptionABG. We'll also be pushing out, oh, I'm sorry. So now to kick off the presentation, I'm going to hand it over to Derek. Derek? Well, thank you, Kelsey, and thank you, Charles, and hi to everybody listening. This is Derek um, from uh, Aberdeen in, in Boston. Uh, Charles, I, I see we've got the East Coast, West Coast thing going here with our photos. I got the tie there, and you've got the open collar, so I'm going to try to correct that maybe for uh, future events. Uh, but anyway, it's great to, to be here, and uh, I really appreciate having the opportunity to talk about uh, this. And, and uh, let me just get started here. Um, when we talk about encryption, it's traditionally talked about in three uh, distinct problems, three segments. And uh, so we talk about the data in the back end, we talk about data on the network, we talk about data at the endpoints. And so, uh, you know, those are the traditional three areas that we speak of. So the title was about back end, and so there we're talking about uh, the file servers, network storage, um, cloud based storage is another example databases, backup media even. Those are all examples of data at rest in the back end. Uh, we don't talk much today about data in motion on the network, uh, but that's obviously an important uh, thing as well. Uh, and uh, we also talk a bit today about uh, data at rest uh, at the endpoints. There's another term, data in use at the endpoints. And for, for me, just to distinguish between uh, one type of at rest, which is back end, and uh, the, the other type of at rest, which is uh, at the endpoint, I, I often personally use the term in use, so just wanted to say that up front so it doesn't confuse anyone. But when we say endpoints, we're talking about the you know, traditional laptops and mobile devices, uh, our phones, our tablets, and also removable media. So th that's what we're really talking about today is the, kind of the comparison between uh, encryption use in, in the back end uh, at the top of the slide here and uh, at the endpoints, which is at the bottom. So I, I've been in this role at Aberdeen as, a, as an analyst and researcher for a while now, for about eight years, and some of the very first studies I did, in fact, were on encryption. So what I did here is just pull together some of the um, results of um, uh, benchmark studies, uh, different snapshots in time, <clears throat> excuse me, so we could see uh, some of the, the, the change in uh, uh, encryption that we see through this uh, benchmarking process. So we've definitely seen in, in all areas um, uh, that enterprise use of encryption has has grown, has definitely grown. Um, I've tried to you know, show on the slide here um, uh, uh, the separation between the, the servers, which you see on the top there. Uh, servers, we see file encryption in, in 2007. It was about 35% of all the respondents in, in that study. Uh, in 2012, it had grown to uh, 59%. And uh, in 2015, earlier this year, it was uh, nearly 80%. Uh, at the endpoints, there's uh, different types of encryption that I'm kind of highlighting here. So uh, if you look at the bottom, if you look at the, the t type of, uh, of encryption file folder at the very bottom of the chart, uh, back in uh, 2007, it was 45%. Uh, in 2012, it had grown to 58%. And, and this year, it had grown to slightly more to 62%. But, but also staying within that endpoint category, you'll see that what we found in, in you know, these snapshots of, of our, our benchmark studies that uh, full disk encryption um, had grown quite a bit from those early days of 2007, just 20 percent. Uh, big jump by 2012 to, to 82, and then uh, even uh, incrementally a bit more uh, here in 2015, up to 87 percent. Uh, I don't have much to say today about uh, mobile device encryption, but we, you know we're obviously concerned about 
the data that might be flowing out to our phones and tablets as well. But that's just maybe a topic for another day. So that's kind of the, the snapshot just in terms of who says they're deploying what. That It doesn't speak necessarily, mind you, to uh, uh, the penetration of these technologies. If companies say, yes, we're using uh, uh, full disk encryption, it, it could be on all of their endpoints. It could be on just a subset of the endpoints. And this, just to be clear, this chart doesn't uh, distinguish between that. So as I've been writing about it for such a long time, this is, you know, what I've uh, talked about before. This is kind of a, you know, a, a qualitative, a logical explanation of the data that we've seen over, consistently over these years. Uh, the, the, we see growth in all three areas, but it is for different reasons. Uh, in other words, the purpose for using encryption uh, it has to do with the risk that uh, organizations are intending for encryption to help them solve. So, those risks can be quite different for each of the three areas, the back end, the network, and, and the endpoints. It's always the case, I've always said this, I hope I always will say that because it's the right thing to say, is that when you make decisions about security and the, the controls that to be put in place to you know, deal with the risk, it has to be made in a specific context and it has to be risk-based. So uh, the context has to do with you know, your own organization and uh, specific factors that go into your environment. Uh, the risks have to do with, well, we'll talk about that as, as we move along. So when we look at the, the, uh, the, 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 the encryption and use at the endpoints in that 87% figure, that was the most recent one from uh, 2015, we saw, uh, just a reminder of what we've already seen, that uh, the, the full disk encryption uh, was uh, highly up from uh, a few years ago. It was just 20% back in 2007. It was nearly 90% here in 2015. And one of the things that I've written about over this time is and what I you know, see through the research and from people who talk about it is that why should we worry whether the users or the technologies can make the right decisions um, about whether the data uh, that should be encrypted is encrypted. We disencrypt everything. <clears throat> it's kind of like the uh, old thing about, uh, you know, you only have to be close in horseshoes and, and hand grenades, right? We, we don't have to worry if something happens, uh, the, the laptop goes lost or stolen, uh, uh, was that data encrypted? Well, yes, it was because everything's encrypted would be the answer, and that's kind of a common uh, sentiment about uh, the, this growth that we see in full disk encryption. And, and just to elaborate on that a bit, the problems that encryption at the, the endpoints um, is really traditionally aiming to solve is that this, these, these things are very commonly lost or, or stolen or simply not accounted for. You know, they, there's sort of a drift in the inventory over time. We, you know, for laptops, we see even like a, roughly a three-year replacement cycle. It's much shorter than that for phones, it's closer to six months uh, to a year. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the risk of loss or exposure of sensitive data uh, at the endpoints is pretty high. And uh, again, the, the use of this approach to encryption, um, it, it just gives you a higher level of assurance that the desired uh, protection is in place if it uh, goes lost or stolen or, or just missing. Um, the, 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 the benefit that people seem to like has to do with this balance and context that I was trying to talk about. Uh, we don't have to involve the users to make the right decision. We don't have to necessarily even worry about classification, which some organiza organizations struggle with. Uh, and, and, you know, over time, these solutions have evolved to have little, little to no impact on the performance, which in the early days was, was a factor. You know, you notice the difference when encryption was turned on. So, so that's a, you know, summary of what it was trying to solve. Change gears now to the, to the back-end systems, which is the focus of our uh, webinar here. And, again, we saw nearly 80% up, up from about 35% a few years ago are, are using uh, file-level encryption. And, uh, obviously, the, the risks are different. When we're talking about file servers, network servers, cloud-based storage, and so on, we're, we're not really worried about those devices being lost or stolen. The, the, the likelihood of those things going missing or being left in a taxi cab or, you know, whatever, the things we do with our endpoints and phones and so on, uh, uh, you know, it's just not as high. So uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the file-level encryption, uh, unlike full disk, has also got a wonderful benefit for the back end. It's actively protecting the data even when these systems are online, available, and accessible, which is to say, uh, you know, virtually all the time. So, uh, in other words, um, if uh, these systems are online, uh, full disk encryption makes the data available to you, but uh, file level encryption would still have that protection in place. So that's a, another uh, explanation of, uh, uh, of the data that we see. And, and these are the things that I've been writing about for, you know, some time. And, um, 
Uh, so the problems we're trying to solve in the back end are different, more likely to be the result of things like uh, uh, external attackers trying to get in, so unauthorized access, um, uh, fraud or theft by, by insiders. We've got the external threat. We've got the insider threat. And then we've got just plain human error. We've got you know non-malicious, kind of well-intended errors by people who are authorized or well-intentioned. They're just trying to do their jobs, but maybe they make mistakes. So, again, file-level encryption is actively protecting the data in all these uh, scenarios, uh, and it just uh, stands out as the more appropriate choice, and we see that reflected in, in, the, in the findings. So here's where I change gears, and I'm just trying, um, you know, as I said, I've been doing this for um, several years now. And when I'm personally trying to do a better job, I encourage all the listeners to try to do a better job of as well, is to communicate um, um, uh, about these solutions and communicate with the, the business leaders inside our organizations uh, in terms of risk. And, and here's, you know, that some of the changes that I've made. Maybe you're already there, but I'm, I'm just you know, sort of putting it out there. Um, we need to do a better job about communicating in terms of risk. Uh, there's really no controversy. There's no disagreement about what the proper definition of risk really is. <clears throat> it's just that most of the time, uh, technical-oriented people, um, like a lot of the people on the phone, I'm guessing, don't always use the term risk uh, properly. So technical people love to talk about uh, things uh, like threats and vulnerabilities and exploits and the technologies that are used to, to, to do them and to protect against them, but those things are not risk. Um, risk is always defined uh, in some version of, of the sentence at the middle of this slide. Risk is the likelihood that something bad will occur and uh, the business impact if it does in fact occur. So uh, again, technical people like to talk about the something bad part of that definition. Uh, uh, the business impact though is, is uh, clearly important. Uh, and, and in fact, in many ways, it, it doesn't matter how likely it is that something bad happening if the impact uh, doesn't matter. And also, it doesn't matter if the impact is, is you know, uh, potentially high if, if there's uh, no likelihood of it happening. So we, we have to express it in terms of both likelihood and impact. That's what risk really means. So the something bad is obviously relevant, but what business uh, uh, leaders and decision makers, because they're the ones who own the risk typically, they uh, talk about risk this way all the time. Uh, they need us to talk about the likelihood and the impact. How likely is it that something bad will happen? If it does occur, what's the impact? Uh, this is how they talk about risk all the time uh, in other ways. Uh, of course, in most of those ways are related to positive aspects of risk. Uh, you know, do we invest in this new product line? Should we acquire that new company? Uh, do we launch or not launch? Um, th th those are risks as well. They're uncertain. We don't. We, there's a likelihood that we'll have the results we want. There's certain results that we're aiming at. That's the impact, um, but they're not certain. So we need to talk about risk in the same way, in, in, in the sense that, for example, on the bottom right there, there's a 20% likelihood that some bad thing will result in a, a greater than $10 million loss in the next uh, year. That's that's a decision that they can do something with, and I'm trying to do a better job at expressing risk in those terms. So I'm changing gears now, and we'll kind of look at the same problem, but from the perspective of trying to use uh, available information to really talk in terms of risk. And I, I was happy to, you know, find a, a source that we can all access. You, you can access this as easily as I did. <clears throat> We've all seen, I expect, the... Uh, Verizon um, data breach investigation report. Um, they have this uh, pretty cool framework, I'm a big fan of it, for describing uh, an actual incident. So they've investigated tens of thousands of incidents over the last decade. They've got this uh, common framework or language for describing uh, the actors um, whose actions affected this asset that's been compromised. The actions, uh, what, what are the steps that were taken? What actions uh, affected the asset? What are the assets themselves, and, and what are the attributes? How, how is it affected? And so they, they call that the 4A framework. There's a, a, a simpler version called the A2 grid, uh, which is a more simple view of the, this uh, various data. It's fo focused on the actions that were taken on specific assets. So again, with the idea of you know, referring and trying to talk about likelihood and magnitude in, in, the, in a more proper way, I decided to use the, the various data that's available publicly. And here's, here's what I found the simplified A2 grid. When we look at the actions and the assets for actual data breach incidents that were analyzed by Verizon and all their partners over, over the years, um, the ones that had to do with servers and the ones that had to do with user devices. So again, we're talking here in this webinar about uh, back-end systems, the, the servers on this line, and user devices, those would be the endpoints. 
and, and these are the number of uh, actual incidents that they, there's uh, publicly, you know, available data from uh, from Barris. There's a link there. If you if you click on that, you'll you'll go right to it. But but you see that 85% of the incidents that they analyzed were in these areas of of hacking, misuse, or error. Um, uh, physical, for example, you see, or environmental. Uh, uh, would would be examples of uh, you know um, uh, lost or stolen type of, of things that just doesn't happen as frequently on the server side. Uh, however, on the endpoints, you can see that uh, physical uh, and and human error those were by far the top uh, 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 more than 80 percent of the incidents were were in those categories. And so it, it's kind of you know uh, data fact based data that that shows um, that those qualitative things that uh, happily <laughs> for me. Uh, the qualitative things that we may have been talking about in the past uh, were, is actually substantiated by the actual data. So when we start to talk about the likelihood of you know what could happen, uh, is it possible that the uh, uh, servers, uh, for example, uh, would go missing? Well, yes, there's always the chance at the end of life or something that uh, as they're retired or repurposed or that kind of thing that, that, that something could happen. But it, it's unlikely, and the data shows that the, the, the high risk to be concerned about are the ones bolded and circled here, hacking, misuse, and error on the server side, and on the on the on the user side, it, uh, by far it's the it's the physical aspect, you know, lost or stolen, and also human error. So, um, in, in many ways, um, well, let me just summarize that and, and kind of an, an eye test for you here, but a little bit of a definition for what they mean uh, at Veris by the hacking, misuse, error, and so on. I won't read it to you, but uh, you can see um, uh, I've, I've lined up these uh, these actions that we just looked at before with a bit more of a description so you can see um, uh, you know, at a glance what, what they mean by each of those things. And then again, just repeated the, 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 the data, this time in terms of percentages. So 51% uh, of the um, actual incidents that were seen on servers had to do with hacking. Another 20% had to do with misuse. Another nearly 14% had to do with error. So together, that's more than 85%. And those are the things that align pretty strongly with the attributes and, and benefits of file level encryption. Uh, and then on the endpoint side, we see 68.6% um, uh, had to do with physical, uh, another 12% had to do with human error, and those are the uh, highest probabilities here, you could say, for, for um, problems on the endpoint side. Those are the things that align well uh, on the uh, endpoint side. And, you know, I guess it, in, in many ways it, it's, uh, you know, again, happy news because it, it sort of explains that the, the market is getting it right. Um, we may not have described it right in, in terms of risk properly defined, but when we talk about full disk encryption at the endpoints, it, it really does align pretty well with the greatest risk that we see. It provides a high level of insurance that the desired protection is really in place. If some, something is lost and someone comes to us and says, hey, are we really sure that that data was encrypted? We can say, well, yes, it was, because uh, everything was encrypted. We don't have to um, have some kind of a, a provenance or trail or confirmation or audit or whatever to prove that uh, I was smart enough to put that in the right folder or actually take steps to encrypt it. So it doesn't require involvement or decisions by users like, like me or, or any of us uh, to encrypt or not. Again, the, the impact on performance is, uh, is, is not there like it was uh, some years ago. And just why worry about whether, you know, we can all make these choices when you can just uh, encrypt everything. Um, and again, we saw in the data the high percentage of, of respondents are using that on the endpoints now, which is up quite a bit from the way it was a few years ago. And again, on the server side, it really, again, the market seems to be getting it right. File level encryption aligns with the greatest risk that we see for data at rest there in the back end. So unlike the endpoints, the back end systems aren't uh, su subject to, you know, that lost or stolen kind of thing, and, and, and full disk encryption wouldn't be actively protecting uh, the systems that are always, or almost always online, available and accessible uh, anyway. So file level encryption is a great fit. It, it actually is protecting the sensitive data, even if unauthorized access has been achieved by those most likely actions that we saw in the, in the Verizon uh, simplified A2 grid there. So hacking, uh, uh, misuse, or human error. So external threats and sort of inside threats or, or just plain mistakes. And again, we saw nearly 80% of the, the folks in our research who are uh, using um, file level encryption in this way. So to, to me, it says, you know, good job. Maybe I'm the one who just needs to change. Or the market uh, looks like pretty much getting it right on, on these things. And um, I'm happy, you know, to uh, you know, see that the things we talked about qualitatively can also be substantiated uh, in terms of risk. 
I make this last comment because there is a movement that I've seen, perhaps you've seen it well, that um, uh, there was a, a talk at the RSA conference called, uh, they use the term anyway, called the fog of more. And out of this fog of more, uh, we've seen movements such as the critical security controls. I think a couple of years ago, it started with the uh, Australian uh, uh, data systems director at the DSD it published the top four controls. And they, they basically said, hey, if we'd have just uh, had these uh, four controls on our endpoints, it would have prevented, I think it was 85% of the incidents that we saw. And so there's this movement for the critical security controls, the CSC, and there's a top 20, and people are talking about, oh, the top 20 controls have uh, the biggest impact. So uh, those movements came out of this issue here, the fog of more. We've got so many options for information security technologies. We've got so many options for controls. It can just make it difficult for any of us, the security teams in any organization, to sort through all the choices and to make the, the right choices based on uh, the context, the mix of environment, and the risk. And so a lot of times when we look for these shortcuts, we look for things like uh, the top 20 or the top four. Uh, we can also say things like I've done, uh, frankly, and this is what I'm admitting, I guess, publicly, um, hey, um, we, we saw uh, full disk encryption you know, has benefits on the endpoints. Why not just use the same technology that we've used, uh, say, on our endpoints uh, for what we need to do on the back end? But as we've seen, and this is the real point, uh, um, this is not necessarily the, the right approach. And, and so I kind of wrap up my part uh, before I hand it off to, to you, Charles, with uh, just this, uh, I guess, uh, you know, older, wiser sort of uh, uh, summary, which is that, you know, maybe it's full circle back to the beginning. When we select any kind of solution, but in specifics here, an encryption solution, we need to use the right tool for the job. And so organizations that are concerned about protecting their sensitive data really need to consider the risk that they're trying to address and, and the rest of the business context, and then choose the security technology that's most appropriate to uh, to their appetite for risk, to their context, and all the things they're trying to balance, the typical trade-offs always apply. Uh, just, just make the appropriate choice and, and the right tool for the job. So that's where I've come to. I find, I find you know, I, I'll, I hope we all continue to try to do a better job of describing these things properly in terms of, of, of risk. And uh, there is a, a full report that I think Kelsey mentioned that that's available, and uh, I'm sure Charles will as well. If anybody does have questions for me, there's my, my email. and. Uh, other ways to, to, to reach me. I'm certainly happy to try to respond to you know questions that we don't deal with today if you if you uh, think of them later. And uh, with that, Charles, I, I think I'm pretty good on time. I just want to turn it over to you. Thanks, everybody, for listening. I'll be here for the Q&A as well. Terrific. Thank you very, very much, Derek. You know, it's, it's really interesting to hear about how misapplying full disk encryption by using it, you know, where it just really wasn't built for it. You know, we're all comfortable with it because it's on our laptops. And, you know, and that does solve 80% of the likely risks. And then we're applying it somewhere else where we are on the wrong side of the 80-20 rule, and it's only covering 20% of the risks. So uh, thank you for going through the numbers and showing us, um, you know, through your analysis, you know, where the technology stands and where it should be applied. So my name is Charles Goldberg. I run product marketing at Vermetric. And as Derek mentioned, I'm on the West Coast. Uh, San, I'm in San Jose. That's where Firmetric is headquartered. And I would like to take a less analytical view of the same um, story. So first, let me start with telling you a little bit about Firmetric. So we are the largest privately held data security encryption company um, out there uh, by far. Uh, we have about 1,500 customers from around the world. Our customers that buy directly from us or through our uh, reseller partners tend to be mid to large size enterprise companies or governments. But if you go to almost any uh, cloud or hosting company, uh, particularly in North America, and you say, hey, could I get encryption with key management as part of your service? They'll say, yeah, absolutely. You know, we could make that as part of the service. And then what they deliver is for metric. We provide that infrastructure. And we do that through a collection of products that are all part of the Vermetric data security platform. And I'll talk a little bit about these different products um, at the end, but what I, what's most relevant for this discussion is typically a product we call Vermetric Transparent Encryption. So I want to look at 
the situation with full disk encryption in back-end systems like your data center or in the cloud uh, compared to a file level encryption solution by using some pictures. So I recruited my office maid and some other folks around the office to help me with this. And what I'm showing you here are my valuables. You can imagine them being in folders like gumball machine, cookie box, you know, windowsill. And I keep my valuables resting in my office. And you could think of my office as a hard drive, or a volume, or even a full storage array. For me to secure my valuables while they're resting in my office, I secure them behind my door, and I lock that up. It's equivalent to shutting down your laptop. Or if you were to shut down your storage array in your data center or your cloud environment, that would be equivalent. Now in order to get to my valuables, I need a key. I need to unlock that door, and very few people have access to this key. So this key would be the first time you turn on your laptop, first time you boot up a storage array, or the first time you turn on some virtual storage in the cloud. Okay. So with full disk encryption, what happens is once the door is open, everyone has access. Everything is in the clear for everyone to see what's in the office and for anyone to enter. So essentially, once my office is open, once the drive is booted up, everyone has access. And they could come in, put their hand into my gumball machine folder and pull out my most valuable contents in my office, and those are my jelly bellies. And this is equivalent to somebody coming into, getting on a server, whether it's an insider like an administrator, a hacker, malware, or APT being on the server. Once the drive is booted up, everything's going to be in the clear, and everything's accessible in those folders. So that's full disencryption. So what does it look like with Vermetric Transparent Encryption? So it's much different. Yes, we encrypt everything. Yes, you need a key to have access. But that's just the start. Right? There's another important step. We have this continuous access control. So even once you have the key, assuming you could get the key, then you still need to pass through some policy in order to get access to the data. So if you're not the right user, coming in for the right reasons, meaning you use the right process, the right application, trying to get access to data that you're allowed to have access to? Is it the proper time of day? And all kinds of other policies, you just simply don't have access to the data. And even if you are the root user or some other privileged user, that doesn't give you access like it does in most solutions. We are process aware. We know how the user authenticated. And if you're a root user and policy says you're not allowed to see this data in clear text, you don't get to see this data in clear text. What's very interesting about Vermetric Transparent Encryption is you can still allow a privileged user through policy to do their job. So they could still copy files, back systems up, move things around as needed. They're just blinded to what the actual data is inside the database or the files. But it doesn't end there. The third thing that Vermetric Transparent Encryption does which is as important as encryption and access control, is logging who attempts to access your data. So whether they are authorized and they gain access, or they are unauthorized and they are blocked, this action is going to get logged. And because we're process aware, because we do privilege user access control, even if the root was to try to do a switch user command or a sudo type command and act as a legitimate authorized user, for metrics aware, we'll still turn them away. And even more importantly, we'll log that action, that they attempted to do a switch user, they attempted to imitate another user, they attempted to get access, why we blocked them, and why, and, and why they you know, didn't get access to that data. So very, very powerful solution. 
So let me go down a detail. I build a happening slow here, so um, and talk about the metric transparent encryption and how it works. So this is an agent-based solution. So you start with a metric transparent encryption agent. These agents support a broad array of Windows, Linux, and Unix operating systems. So right there, it's going to handle the entire back-end systems, data center, you know, cloud, remote servers. You take these agents and you deploy them at the file systems. And that happens very quickly. And it's going to work for all data types, structured and unstructured. And like I said, it's going to let the privileged users do their jobs without the risk of exposing the data to them. These agents deploy in hours, and it'll have no impact on your business because it's transparent to the users, transparent to the applications, transparent to the storage. And of course, it's going to provide the detailed security intelligence that you'll need to detect if you have some miscreant behavior happening on your servers. So if a privileged user tries to access the data, policy says they don't get to see it, they are blocked. An approved authorized user tries to access the data, they are allowed to access that data in clear text. Now you're thinking, Charles, there are some people who could back in the file system. Right? Users like the cloud administrator, or a storage admin, hypervisor admin, cloud admin, but that's okay because they won't have access to the decryption keys. So even if they could go under the file system, get directly to the drive itself, or let's say the drive was disposed incorrectly or stolen during transport, and someone tried to go directly to those disks, that's okay. The data is encrypted. No one's getting anything. You could have tens of thousands of these agents deployed on all kinds of use cases all around the world. And in fact, we have several customers with over 10, 15,000, 20,000 of these agents. They're all going to be centrally managed and controlled by the Vermetric Data Security Manager. And this could be a FIPS 140-2, Level 2, or Level 3 compliant uh, key manager or a virtual appliance. And so this scales really, really well without giving, out, giving up centralized control. And then, of course, equally as important, all these accesses are going to get logged, or all the access attempts are going to get logged. And then you could do something with all this valuable information very quickly, because we have relationships with every major SIM provider, QRadar, uh, McAfee, Splunk, Logarithm, and they all have predefined dashboards to help you go through all these logs incredibly quickly and pull the needle out of the haystack. So I want to show you a quick example of how the encryption, access control, and security intelligence all works together. So what we're going to be looking at here is a picture of our Splunk um, dashboard. So you would go to Splunk Base if you're a Splunk customer, download the Vormetric app for free, and instantly you could start analyzing the Vermetric data security logs. So what we're looking at here is all denied events by a user. So if we see an event that seems suspicious, we simply click on that part of this chart. And then what we'll see is the actual logs that generated those set of events. And these logs are incredibly powerful. They tell an amazing story of what's happening on your server. So in this case, we have an administrator named Dirk. They imitated, they must have done like a sudo command, a user named Steve. They attempted to use a read process on a file called spies list. They didn't get access to that file because they violated a policy in the data security manager called top secret. These are very powerful details to bring into your SIM. They're very hard to get otherwise, especially without impacting the performance of your server. And it helps you detect insider threats, APTs, and it's incredibly valuable if you are in a case where you did have a breach and you want to do forensics and you want to know exactly what was happening on your server and who was doing it, along with all the other path information you get and you collect with your SIM tools.
So that's for metric transparent encryption. That's one of the uh, keystone products that makes up the Vermetric data security platform. But we also give you tools to make it very easy to add application encryption and tokenization with dynamic data masking into existing applications and deployments. So you avoid having to have your developers become cryptographers or experts in tokenization. They just need to write to a few APIs. We take care of that complexity. We'll also manage your keys for third-party devices. So the whole idea is centralize that key management. Use a you know, enterprise class key manager to centralize and manage your key lifecycle all in one place. And if you have data moving into places like S3 or Box or other cloud storage solutions, we can help you control that data after it leaves your premise with our cloud encryption gateway. And again, all our products all get their keys and the key policy from the same data security management solution. And the power of this solution is no matter where your back-end systems are, where your servers are, in your own data centers, outsourced data centers, in clouds, public clouds, or private clouds, storage like S3 or Box, spread out on remote servers around the world, or in big data environments, you could centralize the control of your data and protect it through encryption and access controls. And of course, you get the visibility from the Vermetric Security Intelligence Logs. And we have very strong partnerships with uh, enterprise class software companies and hardware companies um, from all different aspects. Uh, in particular, you know, broad coverage with our SIM tools. This is not even a complete list on this chart. It's a constantly growing. Uh, we're certified on many different big data environments, and we partner with all the leading uh, dam companies. So if you're doing database auditing and monitoring, that protects you in the front end. You also need to protect it from back end access, like your root access or APT access. So we're partnering with those companies. That should give you a lot of confidence that we're going to have high performance and good integration with the applications that you have running in your environment. So to wrap this up, the Remetric Data Security Platform. It really enables you to have a data at rest security strategy. So if you choose to encrypt everything, you now have a cost-effective way of doing it. It's very flexible to have enterprise-wide protection and the compliance that encryption, strong key management, and logging gives you. Vermetric itself has a very good history of delivering new use case support and enabling secure innovations, whether it's in the cloud or big data or whatever comes next. So you can be very confident, confident that your investment in us you'll be leveraging for many years to come. And Vermetric's been around since 2001. Our solutions, very scalable. Many customers, 10,000 plus agent deployments. We support more operating systems than any other company, you know, including Unix. And we allow you to have this global scale, always with centralized control, in a very efficient way. All our encryption solutions are high performance, which minimizes system resources, which is extra important in the cloud, where you might be paying for those additional resources that you're using. And then, of course, the operational simplicity you get by that centralized management and control. All in all, this means you have a single platform to take care of your data at rest encryption, your access control, and giving you visibility of what's happening on all your servers in one place, which is going to give you much lower total cost of ownership than trying to do this with many different types of solutions. So I invite you to learn more. The first Two bullet points would be the, the quick ways. Um, if you want to be a little more proactive uh, and look around, I recommend our YouTube channel. There's a lot of great demos there, including uh, pretty detailed integration examples with McAfee, ESM, and Splunk. But you can imagine how that would look with, say, an HP ArcSight or other vendors. And, and we have other demos on our website, some of the other vendors. And there's other product demos, uh, webinars, and interesting uh, videos there as well. And then, uh, as Derek mentioned, 
his uh, very detailed uh, analytical view of where to apply full disk encryption versus file level encryption and the risks and the likely risks that it will mitigate um, is available as well on the Aberdeen website um, and on our website too. So I want to thank you very much for your time. And I'll hand it back over to you, Kelsey, and see if there's any questions. All right. Thanks so much to Charles and to Derek. And before we begin the Q&A, I would just want to remind everyone that you're welcome to keep submitting your questions through the Q&A widget at the top left of your screen. All right, so let's dive right in. Our first question is for Derek. Derek, when you talk about full disk encryption on the endpoints, how come you didn't mention self-encrypting drives? Um, that's a fair question. I, I kind of was uh, taking a, a bit of a shortcut there because our main focus here was on, on the, the back end. But um, uh, full disk in, in the earliest days referred to uh, uh, software implementations, and then they moved to hardware implementations. And, and the most recent is uh, self-encrypting drives with the, the encryption, you know, uh, built right into the hardware, you know, from the vendor. So it, I, I think the short answer would be. Uh, when I have full disk encryption on, on the slide as a data point in the more recent years, it includes all, all the options. So any, any one of them would fall into the, the same category. I hope that clears it up. All right, thank you. Our next question is going to be for Charles. Charles, can you describe the performance impact of encrypting? Or I'm sorry, encryption? Yeah, so, yeah, so it um, definitely varies depending on the vendor's that you select and the traffic and the environments that you're encrypting in. Uh, in Vermetric solutions, uh, especially in Vermetric transparent encryption, which is integrated and optimized at the file system level, it, it's very low. Um, so typically, we'll thumb 6 to 10% uh, CPU. Since the agent itself is running on the server, the latency becomes insignificant. Uh, compared to a solution that's a proxy-based solution that you have to backhaul to. Uh, so very, very efficient. And in fact, we have a lot of different performance papers. Uh, many of these are done by companies like Intel, and uh, we could share those with you if you contact us. All right, thank you, Charles. Our next question is going to be for Derek. Derek, you made the point that risk should be described in terms of both likelihood and business impact but you didn't really talk about the cost of compromised data. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, somebody's paying attention. That's awesome. Um, good. Um, you, you're right. Whoever asked, it's uh, exactly correct. Um, when we speak about risk, we have to – today we really only spoke about the, the likelihood side, but uh, the, the magnitude of, of, um, of a compromise of, of data is, is critical to the discussion as well. We, we didn't really address that today. Um, I, I have some efforts uh, to describe that. I think the, the 2015 version of the, um, the Verizon Data Breach Investigations Report uh, does a good job for the first time of trying to describe um, the cost of a data breach in terms of uh, uh, likelihood, a range of values as a function of the number of records, as opposed to the frankly very silly things that we've all done as an industry, which is you know throw around numbers like. The cost of a record is uh, $201 per record or something. That, that, that's just not the risk-based thinking at all. But we're starting to see signs, uh, uh, like, for example, the Verizon 2015 that I mentioned. And uh, I've got other efforts uh, as well. But you're, you're absolutely correct. We didn't talk about them today. And in, in the you know, real world, you'd, you'd want to talk about the, the, the magnitude of the impact as well as the likelihood. So good job on that. Thanks, Derek. And the next question is for Charles. So how do you manage encryption when dealing with different storage companies and solutions? Yeah, so that's a pretty broad question. And, and that also shines into the power of a, of a platform solution like Vermetric offers. Um, first, when you're using Vermetric transparent encryption, it really doesn't matter what the storage is, because you're running this at your file server or your database server. So that's why we call it transparent. So that gives you a lot of flexibility. If you're implementing at the application layer, such as application encryption or tokenization, then you absolutely don't care what the underlying storage is. So it'll work with any storage. And if there are cases where you are using full disk encryption, and it's a KMIT-based solution, uh, like NSE drives, um, you know, Nutanix, 
and companies like that, uh, well then you could centralize that key management in the Vimetric solution as well. So it's very flexible and it'll work in all kinds of different situations. And if you have specific questions for your environment, please contact us. All right, thanks so much, Charles. Our next question is for Derek. Derek, you talked about backend systems being less likely to be lost or stolen. But in reality, don't all systems eventually leave the data center? So wouldn't full disk encryption or self-encrypting drives be helpful for that? Yeah, yeah, that's a, I mean, that's fair too. And I, I, I try to touch on this just briefly in passing, but let's just go over it again. That um, yes, it's true that uh, in the back end, eventually all systems eventually, you know, go to their end of life. Um, and, and so there is a, a set of processes or procedures that should be in place for, you know, proper uh, remediation and, and, and retiring of, of uh, the drives, make sure the data is not exposed and, and that kind of thing. The, the point I guess I was making is that the, the evidence that we saw from the Verizon data and I think also from our practical experiences that um, it's highly unlikely. So back on that likelihood point that we were discussing, uh, the facts showed that the, the incidence of something bad happening uh, it's not zero, but it's also very low. So, again, the ones we were talking about uh, today represented 85% of the, uh, the bad things that could happen. So the high likelihood is by far uh, not on the uh, we lose our drives in the back end. Uh, it could happen. It could be a risk you could choose to address, but I, I was just saying focus on the highest risk first, which uh, in our case today we were focused on the highest probability. So. Yeah, the answer is yes, but, um, you know, we're still trying to take a risk-based approach. All right. Thank you, Derek. And, Charles, this question is for you. So how do you protect drives in transit, and if they are disposed of incorrectly, like FDE does? Yeah, so um, good question. And think of encryption and, like Derek's been talking about, kind of risk-based situations as a stack. So at the bottom, the most basic type of encryption, and certainly so much better than nothing, because it will meet you know, that 17% of use cases that you might see in the data center, is full disk encryption. Right? So that encrypts the drive, and during transit or retirement, if retirement is done incorrectly, then your data you know, will be protected, assuming whoever finds that drive doesn't have access to the key. So you better have strong key management. The next level of this three-layer stack would be file-level encryption. So that's where you're encrypting at the file level, doing the access control and the additional security intelligence capabilities, so mitigating far more risks. Um, but that does include everything below it. So everything is still encrypted. So any drive stolen or retired incorrectly, and you know you're having strong key management with a solution like Vimetric, that data is going to be safe then above file level encryption is encrypting even closer to the application and getting very granular in your encryption and potentially encrypting a specific column in a database or tokenizing a specific column in a database or encrypting uh, certain files that an application is generating. So that's application level encryption or tokenization, which are also Vometric products. That would be even more secure and help you um, mitigate even more risks than at the file level. But obviously it's a little bit more work to deploy because now you have to touch your applications as opposed to the transparent. But, you know, since it's the top of the cake, it would also solve the transport or bad retirement um, process uh, behavior. So think of it as a stack. And any encryption that you're doing is so much better than keeping your data in the clear. All right, thank you so much, Charles. So we're getting close to the top of the hour, so I'm going to wrap things up. If you do have any more questions for our presenters, please feel free to reach out to them using the links in the speaker bio widget, uh, widget to your left. And if we didn't get to your question, we'll be sure to reach out to you after the event. So again, thanks to our sponsor, Vormetric, and thanks to our presenters, Derek Brink and Charles Goldberg, for sharing your research, insights, and recommendations. And thanks to the audience for your participation. We hope you found the webinar to be beneficial, and we hope you have a great rest of the day.